So it is a great pleasure to be here. Um, and like Andy said, my name is Lee. Um, I'm working at the University of Maine, and the accent is Israeli. So if I'm not very clear, please uh, stop. And, and one thing that I would like to ask is before I start, I like to have talks interactive. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, so today I'm not going to talk about the little mini details of the complex world, the, the complex physical world of plankton, but rather I would like to um, take you into a global scale ex expedition and really kind of bring you and share with you this magnificent uh, world of plankton. Um, so I was very lucky uh, to be in the right place at the right time uh, and join the a three year expedition around the world um, that was designed to study the microscopic world of plankton. And um, this is uh, an international collaboration led by, by two very inspiring uh, men, um, Etienne Bourgeois from France and Eric Alcenti from Germany. And it involves more than 20 teams from all over the world, from Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Belgium, Ireland, Canada, Japan to the US, um, with many scientists that are involved. So it's really like a consortium of uh, scientists that just trying to understand this invisible world uh, of the plankton. And a project like this, of course, needs funds. So, so we have uh, a lot of uh, foundations, both federal, but interestingly, um, lots of private foundations contributed to this project. Normally, as scientists, we run to all the federal agencies to ask for money, but for this project, there was a lot of support from private foundations. So before I tell you more about the expedition, I want to say a few words about just bring you into the world of plankton. So plankton refers to a diverse group of organisms that live in the water column and basically drift with the currents. Some of them are motile, they can swim, but they cannot swim against currents. And like fish and marine mammals, their swimming ability is very, very limited. So they can maybe move micrometers or centimeters around, but overall, when you think about the ocean and the big currents, they are being drifted with the currents. So this video was produced as part of the Tara uh, expedition because one aspect of the, it's not only about research, it's also about edu education. So if you Google plankton chronicles, you can see lots of beautiful videos about different kinds of plankton that were done as part of the project. So just to uh, summarize, why, why, should, why should we care about plankton? They provide a crucial source for large marine organisms. They are basically the foundation of the marine food web. This, the plankton is the playground or the nursery for many uh, larvae of commercial species. This is where they spend the critical stages of their life, where they feed during the critical stages of their life, and this period determines whether they will be successful and be recruited into the adult uh, stage or um, be removed from the system. And as I will show you uh, in the next few slides, plankton also play a very important role in biogeochemical cycles, especially in the carbon cycle. So really, uh, plankton forms the fabric of life, life in the ocean. This is really the foundation of life in the ocean. And if you think that about our Earth and the ocean, 70% of the Earth's surface is ocean. That means that plankton, who lives at the, um, at the, in the ocean, uh, make up the largest ecosystem on Earth. So this is the really largest ecosystem in Earth, yet, it's, hit, it's a hidden universe because planktonic organisms are microscopic, they are small. Some of them you can see, but most of them you cannot see. So we have a whole world, the largest ecosystem, but we cannot see it. So when we say ecosystem, we think about the organism, the community of organisms that make this ecosystem, how they interact with each other, 
and how they interact with the environment, with their physical and chemical environment. So let me just briefly give you um, an overview of how planktonic ecosystem function. And like many terrestrial ecosystem, uh, this ecosystem is driven by the sun. Uh, we have the phytoplankton, which are the algae. They are the primary produce producers. They are the equivalent to the plants, to the, rest, to the terrestrial uh, plants. They use the, the, the energy from the sun and um, take CO2 from the atmosphere and produce organic carbon, convert the inorganic carbon into organic carbon compounds, which are the uh, fundamental structural components of every cell. I'm so used to go to the computer to switch slides. So what is phytoplankton? Phytoplankton, we refer to, it's an assemblage of photosynthetic organisms that make up the first trophic level in the marine ecosystem, in the pelagic ecosystem. And the word phytoplankton come, comes again from the Greek word phyto, plant. But these are not plants. Taxonomically, phytoplankton are not plants. It's very interesting. They belong to two groups. One group is the bacteria, and the other group is called protists. So if you look at the tree of life, the life domains that are divided to bacteria, there are plants, animals, and you have the fungi, and everything else that did not fit in, in, in those four groups was pulled together, and they're called protists. So phytoplankton belong, most phytoplankton belong to this protist, either to the bacteria group domain or to the protist. Um, and the word plankton, so as it said in the movie, refers to drift or wander, so they drift with the currents. They are unicellular, so they are very small, some of them form colony, um, but yet they provide half of the oxygen that you and I breathe. Uh, although they are small, and in terms of biomass, they are maybe one or two percent of the total biomass of plant material on Earth, they contribute 50 percent, about the same amount they contribute to photosynthesis on Earth. And the reason for that is because they, unlike the plants, uh, terrestrial plants, they divide and grow very fast, so the turnover is very, very high. So they might be small, but in terms of contribution to oxygen, photosynthesis, uptake of carbon from the atmosphere, they are as important as the terrestrial plants that you are more familiar with. And because they are photosynthetic, they require light and dissolved nutrients for growth, and therefore you will find them in the upper layer of the ocean where sunlight uh, is available. And Taxonomically, morphologically, and functionally, it's a very, very diverse group. And I just put here some slides to give you a feeling for this diversity among phytoplankton. They all do the same. They all do photosynthesis, fix carbon, and provide food for the rest of the marine organism, but it's a very diverse group. Um, we start here. Um, does it work? So those dots here. Uh, very important phytoplankton, they are the size of bacteria, okay, one micrometer. They are about the size of bacteria, but they are very, very, very abundant in the open ocean. There are other groups that are slightly larger, two to five micrometer. You can see um, these are here, these groups. And this one is a very interesting. It lives as individual cells about the size of two to five micrometer. But then it can also form colonies that are millimeter in size. So it alters its life um, cycle between this free living of a very tiny little swimming cell to, to a large colony. Now, just to give you a reference for uh, size, the hair, the human hair, the, the thickness of a human hair is about 80 to 100 micrometer. So we are talking a, a about organisms that are much, much smaller, about 100 times smaller than the thickness of a human hair. And then you have groups of phytoplankton that are much larger. So you can see that there is a much, there's a large range of sizes among the phytoplankton, going all the way from one micrometer to something that is about the thickness of a human hair. Okay, so. They do photosynthesis, and then they are being grazed and eaten by zooplankton. So here we have, you can show it here, 
these are the zooplankton. Again, it's a very diverse group of organisms um, that among them you find the grazers, those who feed on the plants, on the phytoplankton, and the predators that just feed on each other. Whatever is not eaten, the phytoplankton material that is not being eaten by the zooplankton settle in the water column. They die when they run out of nutrients and then they sink. If they sink slow, bacteria will immediately come and degrade there. So bacteria are the basically recyclers in the ocean. We tend to think about, in our world, we think about bacteria as in the con connotation of illnesses and sickness and diseases. In the ocean, we like to think about bacteria in terms of recycling of elements um, and biogeochemical processes, not so much about diseases and, and uh, unless you are an aquaculture uh, person that worries about diseases. So as, as phytoplankton settle to the, um, in the water column, bacteria uh, degraded uh, the dead cells. But sometimes, especially when you have large cells of phytoplankton in the ocean, they settle very fast and they are able to escape both grazing by zooplankton and degradation by bacteria. And when this happens, they just settle to the deep ocean where the carbon that they just took from the atmosphere, the CO2 that they just took from the atmosphere is getting sequestered in the deep ocean. So that's a mechanism of removing basically CO2 from the atmosphere to the deep ocean. And we call it the biological, uh, the carbon pump. So one important thing that I want you to uh, take home with you uh, at the end of the day today uh, about plankton ecosystem, that the composition of those system, what, what type of, what species of phytoplankton, zooplankton and bacteria we have in the system, both in terms of taxonomy and size, are very important in determining the efficiency of energy transfer in the ecosystem. So if you start with, um, very small phytoplankton, the ones like we have here, the, the one micrometer uh, uh, cells, the red dots, those cannot be eaten by large zooplankton. Those are eaten by small zooplankton that then are eaten by slightly larger zooplankton. So the transfer, until it gets to the fish, in terms you lost a lot of, there is a loss of energy in the transfer. So this type of of a community will not support high fisheries. If you have a community that is dominated by larger cells that can be immediately eaten by large zooplankton, that then immediately being you have a shorter food web and it's much more efficient um, in terms of transfer to higher trophic level. And these, eco these communities support for high fisheries when those phytoplankton are dominant. So it's the type of, um, Sorry, I will just move. So it's the type of food web that you will have in the system is determined by the community and size composition, and also the ability to export CO2 to the deep ocean and sequester it. Yeah. So it's driven by, because they need light and nutrients. These are the two primary reason. Temp so it's, it's um, Nutrients, I would say, is the primary, actually, it depends where you are in the, in the globe. If you are, if you think, if you are in the open ocean, if you are um, in, in um, if you are in the open ocean, nutrients are, are, are usually limiting. And then when you get a, a source of nutrients, then you will have a bloom. But if you are in the Arctic Ocean, for example, there's plenty, there are plenty of nutrients, but there is no light. So as soon as spring comes and you have light, you suddenly get a big bloom. Um, but bl blooms also depend, so nutrients and light is one, but also who are the grazers? So the very small grazers can grow very fast and immediately catch up with the phytoplankton. So sometimes they don't let the biomass to accumulate, you don't see the bloom. The larger gra grazers, um, like um, uh, the shrimp-like or the krill-like, they have a very complex life cycle. So until sometimes they come after the bloom, so the phytoplankton can escape this grazing and you see the expression of the bloom. So 
So the, the, it, it's a combination of different reasons. Oh, sorry. So, so water column is is the uh, is the think about the ocean as from the you are looking from the top of the ocean, the surface till depth, and that thing we call the water column. Um, so it can be, and people refer to it can be the top 50 meter, the top 200 meter, the top. Usually, light is available. Depends if you are in coastal area, like in the Gulf of Maine near the coast. Um, the light will penetrate to 30, 50 meter. As you go offshore, light penetrates deeper and deeper because you have less particles that absorb and scatter the light in the ocean. So in near Easter Island, where we were with Star, light, we, we could see still light at around 200 meters. But in coastal areas, it's, it will be 80, 50 meters. So those conditions vary a lot between different regions of the world ocean. Okay, so the ocean is big and largely unexplored. And we are still, we, we know quite a bit about plankton, but still fundamental question of how many species there are for the different group of plankton. Who does what, with whom, when and why, um, how diversity and community structure change along environmental gradients. These are still pretty much open questions. And as we all experience um, uh, climate change, those questions even become more, more important because how, how those communities will respond to changes in the ocean? Who will be the winners? Who will be the losers? What the ecosystem will be look like? But without knowing the foundation of what it is now and what shapes it now, it's very hard to predict what the future will look like. So if you take one liter, that's, they're small. If you take one liter of seawater, so here, this is half a liter. This bowl is half a liter. If you just fill it with seawater, you will get the whole community that I was just describing to you in that one liter. So in, in one liter, you will get between one to 100 zooplankton. So these are the zooplankton here. Uh, you will get between 10,000 to 10 million protists. And the protists, remember, these are the phytoplankton and also some of the small grazers. And then if you look at bacteria, if you start to count bacteria, in this one liter, you will have 100 million to 1 billion bacteria and 1 to 10 billion viruses. So just in this very small volume, you have a lot of life and very complex life and very complex interactions. But again, it's not visible to, to us. So on land, we know, we, 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 we are familiar with the different biomes. We are familiar with the desert, with the savanna, with the tropical forest, with the tundra. We see that as the vegetation changes, the organisms that are associated with these, the, the, the grazers and the predators also change. The whole ecosystem changes too. In the ocean, it's very difficult for us to monitor it. At best, we can see maybe that the color of the ocean change, maybe slightly greenish or slightly bluer, but we cannot see all those um, uh, changes and patterns. We got very good at uh, looking at changes of phytoplankton biomass from space. And this is always incredible for me because, as I told you, they are so small and we need microscopes to see them. How can we see them from space? Um, we basically use the, the fact that they absorb light and they absorb, absorb light at uh, certain wavelengths, very specific wavelengths. So we can look at the, uh, the satellite. What the satellite does, it measures the spectrum of the incoming radiation from the sun and look for those missing wavelengths that were absorbed by the phytoplankton. And based on the change in the spectrum of the light, you can estimate how much phytoplankton you had in the water that absorbed the light. And we can make these nice maps of global distributions of phytoplankton. So what you see here, the chlorophyll concentration is a proxy for the biomass of phytoplankton. So when you have blue colors, blue color means very, very low biomass. Think about the biomass of a desert. When you have green and, and dark green or toward red color, it means a bloom, a very high biomass. So we can start to see patterns on a global scale. We can see that the um, 
center of the oceans are very blue. There's not much biomass or phytoplankton. Near the, near the coasts, near the continents, we have higher elevation. So we can start and understand patterns and changes of the biomass of phytoplankton. But that does not tell us who is there and who is doing the job and what they are doing. So we became better with the data that we already have gathered to build models. And this, these models, each color here, represent a different group of phytoplankton. And you can predict what phytoplankton will prevail in different regions of the ocean depending on light and nutrients. But again, this is a model. We need a lot of data to, to verify that actually the predictions are, are real. So, so that was the idea of the Tara Ocean uh, project, is to go and measure the planktonic ecosystems from end to end, from the viruses all the way to the fish larvae on a global scale, and not just focus on the surface of the ocean, but look at it also vertically up to 2,000 meters. And not just look at who is there, but also provide the environmental context. So measure all the parameters that are important in terms of the environment, the nutrients, the light, the pH, the salinity, the temperature, um, and many other uh, parameters. And the idea here is to use state-of-the-art uh, methodologies and standardized protocol. One of the problem is People have been studying planktonic ecosystem. It's not new. But different groups looked at different components of the ecosystem or used different methods. Here we wanted to have uh, a global way to look at phytoplankton, include all the components of the ecosystem, and use the same methodology so we can compare from one ocean to another, from one region to, to another. Doing something like this has a lot of challenges. First is funding. You know, how do you find, find a project like this? It involves a lot of data. How do, you, how do you track even the different groups that are doing and what they are doing and, and the samples? How do you ship the samples? Some of those samples, you know, if you put them on an airplane, by the time they get to your lab, um, they're not good anymore to analyze. So you need to... Um, ship them in, in a very careful way. So the handling of the sample should be very careful. We end up using a company that actually deliver, that specializes in delivery, delivery of organs for hospitals because they have the facilities to handle uh, delicate samples uh, in a way that is... Uh, um, and then the, th the other thing, and then the last thing is to develop computing and uh, tools to organize all the data and the modeling, to put it in one database that can be shared with the community afterwards. So the, the, the support, a lot of the support for this expedition come from the Tara Expedition Foundation for Marine Research. This is a French nonprofit organization that finance long-term scientific research that concerns um, climate change and um, global warming. And they have three missions, support scientists, increase general awareness about environmental issues, mostly that are related to the ocean, and diffuse scientific data for education and policy purposes. So part of the program was also outreach and education, not just the, the research itself. And they have a boat. The boat is Tara. Uh, the boat belongs, so the, the, the woman that founded this organization, her name is Anis B. She's a fashion designer in Paris. She loves the ocean, she's passionate on the ocean, and she worries about the future of our oceans. So she owns the boat, and she gives the boat for research. It's a schooner, uh, 118 feet long. Um, it is made of reinforced aluminum, so it's not your typical schooner. Um, it was designed, actually, to work in polar uh, regions. So it's ice resistant. It's not an ice breaker, but it's ice resistant. And it can, it, it does not have a keel, or you can lift the keel. And when you hit ice, it basically just rides on the ice um, when it sails. It was equipped with uh, oceanographic equipment. Uh, we had a winch that can put, put equipment down to 3,000 meters. 
And um, the autonomy of this boat is 5,000 nautical miles, so you can really go far for a long time and, and do your sampling. And it has room for, for 14 people. So most of the legs, we were seven scientists and seven crew members um, on the boat. And crew members included the cook, who is also a sailor, and a journalist, because that was part of the public outreach, and the journalist is also a sailor. So that's kind of the where some of the... Um, so there were two phases to the expedition. The first phase uh, took place between 2009 and 2012, where Tara left, oops, was not, okay. where um, Tara left the home port. So the home port uh, of the boat is in Loria, which is in the western coast of France, um, in Brittany. So left Loria and sailed through the Mediterranean Ocean, down the Red Sea, into the Indian Ocean, and crossed the South, South Atlantic, headed south to the Southern Ocean, then up in the South Pacific, North Pacific, then back to the Atlantic through the Panama Canal, crossed the Atlantic back to Loria. So that was the first phase, the global we were missing one ocean, and it was the Arctic. And the Arctic um, is especially important now, given all the changes um, in, in uh, ice thickness and extent in the Arctic. Uh, so, but to do the Arctic, the boat, as you can imagine, was pretty beaten after two and a half years of sailing nonstop and sampling nonstop. We needed more money to be able to go to the Arctic. The boat had to be fit fitted. So going to the Arctic is not it's not an easy, um, uh, you, don't, you don't just go and sail. So we took a six months after the first part to get the boat ready. And then um, in 2013, between May and November, again, the boat left. Well, here. The boat le left Loria and sailed to, to Norway. And then the idea was in one summer, to circumnavigate the Arctic Ocean. As you probably heard, ice is, is uh, both extended and thickness is retreating and shipping routes are open, becoming uh, more open and more accessible uh, in the Arctic. So it was to demonstrate that th two passages, the Northeast Passage here and the Northwest Passage here are accessible now and, it, and you can complete a route in one, in one summer. So we went through the, the Russian Arctic, and then uh, Alaska is here. So this is Russia, Alaska is here, Canada is here, Greenland. So completed the whole uh, circumnavigation. So this is not a very clear map, but it just what it does show you the route. Each block here is a station where we sampled. So this map is just to show you the extent of sampling. Um, how, you know, where, where samples were taken from for, for, from, for different analysis. So how, what was the strategy of sampling? How do we go about sampling in, in such a global scale? So here's the boat. Um, to design the stations where we want to sample and where we want to, to stop, we use satellite maps. So here's an example of a map. Okay. The map here in the corner it shows you two things. It shows the temperature. So blue is cold water, red are warm, is warmer water. And then it also show you a, a sea surface uh, a height. And sea surface height gives you some information about physical features. Is there a front in the water or the eddies? So every day we will get to the boat a map like this. And we could see how temperature is changing and how physical features in the, in the ocean are changing. And based on that, we designed our sampling. In the Arctic, we would also get ice maps because we were restricted. Um, our movement was restricted depending on the thickness of, of the ice. So we would get daily maps and then we will design our sampling. We, we sampled, um, uh, I will explain it um, in the next few slides. And then all the data, every time when we go to a port, uh, 
we shipped all the samples back to Germany, and in Germany, that was the center where all the samples arrived. And then the samples were distributed all over the world to the different labs that were responsible for the analysis of the different samples. So here's the back of the boat. Um, we did a total of 171 stations, and it amounts to about 35,000 biological samples that are now being processed. As you can imagine, it will take a while to complete this um, analysis. And um, this uh, rosette or package, it's, we call it the CTD rosette. This is re really the horse work of oceanographers. Um, on this rosette, you mount uh, a lot of instruments that measure the conductivity of the water, the temperature, um, light, elements of nutrients, and along these are, it's called rosette because you have a circle of bottles that you can use to collect water. So you measure the physical parameters and you collect water at the same time, you bring them to the dock, and then, sorry, and then uh, you can process them. In addition, we had, uh, we, we set some instruments so we can continuously measure as we go. So basically what we did is we pumped water um, into the boat and run it through, run it, run it through a, a series of instruments. And in the lab, we had computers that showed us the maps of, of, of the properties that we were measuring. And that was continuous, um, continuous measurements. And I'll show you them. And we have 70,000 miles of underway sampling of continuous measurements of temperature, salinity, and optical properties, pH, and other parameters. So, and we could see it real time. This is two examples from the circumnavigation of the Arctic. Um, the left map shows you the temperature. So the cold, the blue color again is colder water. The warm red colors are the warmer water. And on the right panel is the salinity. And we could see as we were sailing using this type of information, how the temperature is changing along the transect, how salinity is changing along the tra transect, and also biological parameters. So what you have here in this map is an optical, optical, so the left panel is phytoplankton biomass derived from some optical measurements. So again, the blue color is very low biomass, the red on the scale is high biomass. So you can see that the Arctic is not uniform in terms of biomass. We had hot spots, we had spots where there is not much, and we also use the optical measurements that we did too. We can get from the attenuation of light some information about the size of the particle in, in the water. So blue represents relatively larger particles in the water, and red represents relatively smaller particles in the water. And again, you see that as you move from different regions of the Arctic, part, the, the particles change in size in the Arctic. But this is bulk measurements. They really don't tell us what makes those particles. If you really want to know what it is, you need to start and either take a microscope and look, or use uh, genomics to kind of see who is there, look at genes and see who is there. And these are the two approaches that we use to go into more details. But before we do that, the, the size of plankton is huge. We're going all the way from viruses that are nanometer in size to large zooplankton that are, um, could be centimeter in size. There's no one net that can capture them all. So what we, you have to do is to, uh, what, we, what we were doing is we used a series of nets, or filter basically, to isolate size components of the population. So for the bacteria, we use very small, very fine filters to get the viruses and, uh, and the bacteria from the water sample. Then we, we used a series of slightly coarser nets to get the protist. And then we used even coarser nets to get the large zooplankton so we can look at the different components of the ecosystem because otherwise it's just a mix of everything and it's hard to, to see what. Um, so this is just an example of all the different nets that we were using 
uh, during the um, during the cruise. So each net here, each net here has a different mesh size. So it selects for a different fraction of the community. So we would filter. This is a um, whatever is smaller than this mesh stays in this net. The rest is moving to the next net and to the next net. And finally, we took all the water and we pumped them into this van that was on the deck. And inside we had small filters to filter the water. And on the filters, we could collect the viruses and the bacteria from the samples. So then we took all those size fractions that we collected and we did two things. Part of the samples were, went to um, extract DNA and RNA and do the sequencing this, and sequence them to see what kind of genes do we have there. And the other went to uh, imagery, different um, approaches of imaging to actually see and count who is there. And what I, I will just, we, we use different instruments. I have example of just one instrument that we used here, and here is here. Uh, this, is, this is called the flow cam. So one of the problem is, we need to see who is there. We need to identify what species are there. We may, we may want to measure the size. But if you do it by a microscope, it will take forever. It's, if you ever looked at a microscope to try and count and size all the particles, that's really. So we need a way that we can more efficiently count them faster and larger volumes. And one of the instruments like this is the FlowCam. Um, it was developed here in Maine and is produced and, and uh, here in Maine in Falmouth. I uh, know you're in Yamus, right? Starbuck, okay. In the neighborhood. <laughs> um, and basically, it, it, the, the instrument, so this is the flow cam. It has a flow cell, uh, particle when you have your water sample, you, it, it flows through the flow cells and there's a camera and the light source and particles that come in, in the um, region of the camera, you, the camera takes an image. And you just get a lot of images of the organisms. So now it's faster, it takes, but you're still left with a lot of images that you now need to sort and make sense out of them. And I don't know if you go through old photos, how long does it take? And uh, But th those images are great, but now we want to put them together in the groups and see what groups are available, how many are there for, it, it, for each group. So we use a computer computer assisted sorting. So basically we train a computer to identify shapes. And give, so we build a learning set for the computer and we let the computer do the sorting for us. And then we go back and verify that the computer, because computer is a computer after all, we have to go and verify that the computer indeed put the different species in the right boxes where the, it was uh, needed to put. So this is really still a work in progress. Uh, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of time to process all these samples and count them. But I just want to show you a few highlights, highlights of uh, things that um, are already kind of in publication and, and, and coming out from the... So using the genomic data, um, this project established the largest microbial gene catalog uh, that has been ever done. The largest one that was established before was for the human gut flora. This was kind of the, and in the ocean, we have four, uh, four times more gene uh, than what the human gut project uh, found in terms of gene. Uh, and this is both, both projects are far larger in terms of genes uh, than this, the human genome project. Um, so um, what this table shows you, um, so each color here is, a, is a, an ocean, okay? So um, this is the, for example, the Southern Ocean, South Pacific Ocean, North Pacific Ocean, um, South Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, uh, Red Sea, and Mediterranean. The blue bars are genes that were found in Tara but were previously identified by other study. And the red bars are new genes that were not seen before. So you can see that, and, and 
it, the, 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 the top bar represents samples that were taken at the surface. The, the middle um, panel sample that will that were taken between 30 to 100 meters, and the bottom panel are samples that were taken below 200 meters. So you see that at the surface we still have a lot of new genes that were not uh, identified before, but about half half of the genes were um, uh, identified before and half were new. As you go deeper in the ocean water, the proportion of new genes increases. And, and the point here is that really the extent, the, the, the genomic potential in the ocean is huge and it's really largely unexplored. We know very little about it yet. And it's important to look at the, at the genome, the, uh, it, it helps us to know because very few, so far we were able to, very, to culture only a very small percentage of the bacteria in the ocean. We cannot, not all of them will grow in our culture. So if we think about diversity, richness, it's based on what before diversity of bacteria in the ocean was based on what we were able to culture, but it's only a small fraction of the bacteria that live there. So using genomic approaches, now we can suddenly, we realize that it's much more diverse than we um, thought based on our culturing methods. And this is, um, uh, an example of using the, looking at richness of um, microbial um, cells um, as a function of temperature. And the bar here represents the, the latitude. So these are polar or, or higher latitude, and the red is the equator. And you can see that the genes, that the richness of genes is low at, lower lat at, at higher latitude and low and low, somewhat low at the equator and peak at somehow intermediate, intermediate latitude, but also um, kind of intermediate temperature. Now, this is not complete because we don't have the Arctic samples here. This is from the Southern Ocean. So it will be very interesting now when we start to get the data from the Arctic to add it and see how it changes, how it changes this, if the, it changes this pattern. Okay, the other thing that I told you, so this just tells us about the potential of, you know, the, the richness of, of different um, taxonomic group there. But one of the things is that we also wanted to know in an ecosystem is what are the associations between the different groups, right? Who interact with who and how do they respond to the environment? So now, once you have the genes of different uh, organisms, you can build what is called the heat map. So here, those, Bars are the different species uh, of plankton. And it, it's like, it's family trees. Basically, it's your family tree. Uh, this, this is one species, and you see that it's related to this species. Uh, so species here are very far from species here. These are all relatives. So you kind of build the family trees for all the species. You, you can see the relationship between them, and here, you just plot that you have the, the environmental parameters, latitude, salinity, temperature, availability of nutrients. And you can start to look at correlation between them. Where, where there is high correlation, you get, you have a you, uh, the high correlations are represented here by red colors. Weak, very weak correlations are represented by blue color. So now you can start to see, okay, what type of organisms have high correlations with these conditions? And you start to build those associations. So this is just an example of how you can use, obviously it's, um, yeah, it takes more, but you can start and see who is, who is with whom and where. And the last thing is that you can now put all those organisms together and see who goes with whom. And I know that these are complex, but it's not as complex. So basically, each color here represents a group, a species or a group of organisms. And I want you to look at this group. This is one group of phytoplankton called diatom, and the green one is another group of phytoplankton called dinoflagellates. And this purple one are symbionts, just a group of symbionts. This map shows you who occurs with whom. So those connections shows so if you look at the parasites, they have connections to everyone. They're associated almost with everyone. If you look at the diatoms, they don't, they, 
connect with very few organisms that were in those samples. Dinoflagellates, the green may connect more. This is a map that shows exclusion. Okay? So now the brown is the diatoms. They don't they don't go well. They don't go, get along with many. Uh, they, they, it appears that they, are, they exclude many organisms when they prevail. The, di the dinoflagellates exclude less. And again, the, um, the, the, the symbionts exclude some, but they, but they also co-occur, so suggest that there is the, the relationship between symbionts and host could be very specific. So again, using the genomic information, you can start to see who, who works with who and who does not get along. Um, so this is just the tip of the iceberg, uh, obviously. Um, and many people, we are still working on this project, many groups, and it really takes a village to kind of bring this whole story to completion and probably many more years uh, to come. One important thing to say is that the way we see the ocean and see this organism depends on the methods that we are using. And each method is like one lens in a camera that has a one filter, and we interpret our world via that filter that we use. So our hope is that by using many lenses, many methods, and many filters, we can put a more complete pic pictures of this interesting world. And like I said, part of the project is also outreach, so there's been Along with the science, there's been a, long of a, a, a big effort to outreach and tell people um, about this world of plankton. Uh, it includes every port uh, call that we had. The boat was open. We, it was no time to travel and sightseeing. It was, we hosted schools, and people from the community gave tours and, and, and talked about our research. As I said, there was a reporter on each cruise and books exhibits, art, and because Anis B is a fashion designer, even, even some fashion, uh, plankton fashion. And I thought I will just end with sharing uh, with some photos of life on board. And um, thank you for listening. <laughs>